Yeah, I, I did come for a holiday originally and to go to a wedding, but I've been writing the book over uh, several years now and been delayed for various reasons. The church I was in, suddenly on one Sunday I was preaching and a man with the longest white beard I'd ever seen rolled up. And afterwards he said, you're Brian Stone, aren't you? And I said, yes. He said, you're a creationist, aren't you? And I said, yes, I am. And that's all I thought about it. Uh, and then a couple of weeks later he was there again. But just before that I was in my study and there's a book on the table out there which you can borrow. It's called Dismantling the Big Bang. And one of the authors is Alex. It's Alex Williams. I read it, I know all about him, I read his papers, but I've never met him, so I go out and say, are you Alex Williams? And he is. Then he started coming to our Bible study group, and then he found out I was about to do a talk at a, quite a big church in uh, Perth, and he said, what's the topic? And I said, oh, it's the difficulty of having functional intermediates. So if A come, or B comes from A, all the way through, if it evolves, every single step has to be able to stay alive. And he said, oh, that's interesting. He said, do you know anything about molecular biology? And I said, not much at all. He said, you need to know. Now, he's not a well man, so for the next two months, once a week, I was able to go to him for two hours, and he taught me molecular biology. So my training is in engineering, by the way. And uh, as a result, I'm going to give this talk a week out, because he's very critical, he said, I think, Brian, you're going to make a fool of yourself. Uh, thank you for the inspiration of confidence. But because of that, there was so much stuff I'd never come across that people at the end of the talk, which were 150 people, some of them hadn't heard quite a bit of it. And as a result, we thought we should write a book. People were asking for a book. There's a first draft of the book, and I'm not selling books afterwards, right? Because it's not been published. Some people have seen a, a, a draft of it and given comments. And we'll see how it goes. So this is to introduce you to a topic which, depending on your age, proves to be either well, astounding or you've come across some of it before, but probably after the break, and it's not two two-hour sessions, you only tell me one hour followed by. Yeah, that's good, right? Thank you so much. Yeah. So let's just go on this and you'll start to see. So the book's title is Evolution, Increasing Complexity or Decay, and it uh, goes like so. So I see. It takes a while. I'm, I'm not connected wirelessly to over there. So these things, are, oh, they come, it's got one at last. So the, the main objective is to show that those who believe in evolution are actually a practicing believers. They're faith people, right? It's not the fact that science has proved them right and we are these simple people who believe anything. No, they've got a phenomenal number of beliefs. And that hopefully will become clear as we go along. Well, and then I will stress the, the need to go for a repeatable science. I've got another talk on what is the difference between a, a scientific fact and a fact? Is a scientific fact better than a fact? No, the only reason is a scientific fact is because it's repeatable, that you can do it again. And once you get into history, you can't do it again. So what currently exists is what you look, need to look at, and you can get scientific facts from what's around now, but when you extrapolate backwards, you start to get into a faith position. So the emphasis shows on what is now known, right? So we'll spend part of this session looking at how life works. How come you're still alive and ticking over, you know? What's going on in every cell in your body? And then probably in this session we'll get through this one, which is to show that there is no natural explanation of the origin of life. There isn't one. One of the catchphrases that take away, if, if you haven't another, and I'll say it again later on, is there are big prizes available for anyone who can explain. And they have never been collected. Right? There's no Nobel Prize being awarded for this. No one knows how life could possibly have started from non-life. So then that's a belief statement, and they can't therefore say we're definitely wrong. And that's very encouraging for young folk who get hammered at university. And we're going to look at the complexity of life. So I hope you'll stay awake. And uh, we, if you feel you're getting a bit lost, good. Because it's so complicated. How, well, lots of explanations are given which are so simplified that you begin to think life isn't very complicated. But it is. 
Well, I don't know how get, you can get a headache quite quickly. <laughs> and then we will look at several uh, less well-known topics, probably after the break, and I'll choose the ones that probably seem to be the best in the light of what people would say to me. And then this is the crunch question. Are there any observed examples of any life form increasing in complexity? Anything getting more complex? There's lots of examples of slight change in color and height. We're, we're quite a diverse bunch, the way we look, color of hair and so on, but we haven't got more complicated. We're still the same complex human people. And then to compare two faiths. There's, if you like, the materialistic faith with no God, and then there's the Christian faith. Now, all the criticisms of evolution, which will come out, uh, some of my reviewers who are friends of mine who are atheists, uh, wanted me to stress that these criticisms are not just because I'm a Christian. They're just valid criticisms. And anybody with any faith would be able to ask these particular questions. So these are topics. I'm not going to do the science one because I've more or less done it just now. I want repeatable science. When it comes to evolution, we'll think about that in a moment. What do you mean by evolution? It's one of those words that has more than one meaning. Right? There's evolution, which is that, well, a, a fish loses a fin. That's not evolution. That's devolution. It's getting simpler. The question is, where did the fin come from in the first place? I'm looking for things that get really complex, and we'll look at a few of those in a moment. So I'm going to start here, and we might cover these three topics before we eat. We'll see how we go. Right, biblical creation. This is my position that I hold to. Right, I'm used to looking at the stars, and Christians do, and we're encouraged in the Old Testament to do so. Look at the stars and see what God has made. And... Uh, Paul writing to Romans says people are without excuse because what might be seen about his power and eternal Godhead is clearly seen in what he's made. And then Psalm 13 talks about us. And until recently we really didn't know. The last couple of hundred years, what we know about how we work has become, oh, we are complicated. One of my PhD students, when I started talking about how we work, he became quite alarmed. Because as an engineer, he could think of everything that could go wrong. <laughs> Here we go. This is dropping off. <laughs> nice one, yes. Anytime, just throw them in. That would be good. Yeah. Here we go. Mm. Why does it take so long? There we go. So the alternative to a theistic position where, where God is involved is the natural one. Um, this, is a, this is one of the advanced uh, sites in the States, so it's, it's got a high reputation, and they define it. So I shall actually read it in case you can't see it, because some of the slides have quite detailed stuff on, and that's because I wasn't sure if we get this setup working where I can see. Right, so I'm going to right, biological evolution, simply put, is descent with inherited modification. So your offspring are different to you. All life on Earth shares a common ancestor. You've got to be joking, but that's what they believe. That's a belief statement, but it's not presented as a belief statement. It's presented as a fact. Just as you and your cousins share a common grandmother, through the process of descent with modification, this common ancestor gave rise to the diverse species that we see documented in the fossil record and around us today. Evolution means that we're all distant cousins, humans and oak trees, hummingbirds and whales. So when you hug a tree, you know, it's your relative, well, distant relative. But, so that's the view, right? But do you know this all came from a single, uh, life form that arose by a method that, or, or a way that nobody has ever explained. So this is how it's explained. This is how it's taught in secular schools and at universities. And at universities, if you don't hold to this view, you will get mocked and, in, and they'll embarrass you in front of the class. Right? Simple life forms. This one up in the corner here, 
is a bacteria. Uh, inside is uh, some DNA. It's in a circular form. But early on, nobody knew about DNA, so it's just a bacteria. Now, for that to turn into us by having offspring which are changing means you need to have some way of varying. Right, so your offspring have to be different. But not only do they have to be different, they have to have the inheritance of that with them as soon as they can pass it on. So you need to have something which is going to be a change. You must be able to survive with the change, and it must be one that you can pass on. And when Darwin wrote his stuff, he had no, no, he had no idea about these. Just that he believed from looking at fossil record and things that uh, this argument of uh, uh, descent with chains would have been the one that worked. And then he, had, he discovered natural selection was his way of deciding why it would have changed. He did have a puzzle with it. Because the idea is natural selection works. It's that those who are the most fittest, that is, those who will have the most offspring, are the ones who will survive. So you need lots of offspring. There's far more bacteria than us. So why did bacteria ever think about evolving? Why did they need to? You haven't got that, have you? Right? Darwin had saw that himself. It's normally quite hidden. Right? The argument is natural selection works as you have more offspring, like you. So if you get an advantage, you pass it on. And in the end, I know, I, I know where to pitch it down. Right? I was born in Wales. We are a superior race. <laughs> you may not know about it. When my mother looked down into the cradle and saw me, she knew she had a mutant son, but not, not one which was going downhill. I was advantageous. I was, in fact, superior to all the Welsh people currently existing. As a result of that, my offspring and my descendants, and there's quite a few of them here, they all have this advantage, and they are superior like me. <laughs> and now I can do the Adolf Hitler bit, and my kind are going to conquer the earth and rule it because the rest of you are inferior and the sooner we get rid of you, the better. So this, this stuff is serious stuff. It really is. Because the people that you get rid of are the ones who are not like you. You will always assume that you are superior. Oh, by the way, I'm not a superior Welsh person. <laughs> I'm now Australian too, so there you go. So survival of the fittest. So how does inheritance work? So here we go. This is quite a big jump. So up on screen, that's um, DNA. And Darwin knew nothing about DNA. And all the early stuff uh, was, you know, it didn't know about DNA at all. DNA was basically discovered as a double helix in about 1953. And two people are credited with that, which was this man, James Watson and Francis uh, Crick. But what you never told is they didn't know it was a double helix till our female researcher somewhere else. She was the first one to find out, because it is so very small, this, that it was a double helix. So to get the idea of the size, I don't know how you go with micrometers. But, so in any one of your cells inside the nucleus, there's this DNA. It's in various uh, chromosome forms, but if you joined it all up, that's the contribution between your mother and your father. It's about six feet, two meters long. Right? That's that real length. I haven't scaled it at all. Right? The nucleus, however, is only six micrometers. I so small, it's hard to see, you won't see it. So I'm now just going to scale up the nucleus to be the size of a tennis ball. And if I scale up your DNA by the same amount, 130 kilometers long. You try and get that in the nucleus without getting tangled. <laughs> no, seriously. That is just what I think, how it's done, right? So it, this is an immense thing. Uh, and yeah, off we go. Boom. So when, we, when it was discovered, um, the man, one of the two people who put the whole shooting match together was called a Crick, and he wrote to his 12-year-old son. Right, so you should be able to follow this, all of you, more or less. He said, it is like a code, this DNA. If you're given one set of, because it's 
like a ladder with rungs. If you're given one side of the ladder, uh, then you can write down the other side. Now we believe that D dot, N dot, A dot, this is from his letter to his son, is a code. That is the order of the bases, the letters. The order of the letters makes one gene different from another gene. Just as one page of print is different from another. You can now see how nature makes copies of the genes. Because if the two chains unwind into two separate chains, they each act like a template. And things come along and you end up with two of them. Now you won't have understood that, but I've now got a series of animations. Right, right? These are not creationist animations. They're from uh, very reputable scientific people. And every now and again you will cringe, possibly, as to what they actually say. But we will see how we go. So this is this DNA thing. There's lots of different ways of representing it. You can't actually see it with a microscope. Right? So these are these uh, letters, as they call them. These letters are just the initial letters of a long name. Uh, the, the book I've written, I try to remove all technical terms. That's the objective. And then I have my own way of representing it, which is this color scheme here. Right? So it's like a, this is a DNA thing unwound, and it's like a ladder. And if you pull it apart, that's what you get. But now we start to get movie, so we'll see how we go. Sound? this thing. Right? Get the idea? So those letters, a bit like the letters of an alphabet, and the order of them is like a sentence. And it's got information in it. And it can be read and used to make make us. Right? So let's keep going. So that's unzipped. This is how you copy it. Right? So every time a cell has to be duplicated, right? Because it, that's what happens, especially as, as a baby is grown. But that's going on inside, and it's going on inside all the time. And this machine is going really fast. The problem with these animations is they don't show you what else is in the cell. It looks like it's all on its own. No, it's in a cell which has got well, it's a, it's more viscous than the white of an egg, and that this is there. And it is really very small. 
So this is how you get a, a copy, which is how you get inheritance, right? So you copy it. So what, what use is it for? No, it didn't forward it. Sorry about that. Here we go. What you are about to see is DNA's most extraordinary secret. How a simple code is turned into flesh and blood. It begins with a bundle of factors assembling at the start of a gene. A gene is simply a length of DNA instructions stretching away to the left. The assembled factors trigger the first phase of the process. Reading off the information that will be needed to make the protein. Everything is ready to roll. Three, two, one, go. The blue molecule racing along the DNA is reading the gene. It's unzipping the double helix and popping in one of the two strands. The yellow chain snaking out of the top is a copy of the genetic message, and it's made of a close chemical cousin of DNA, called RNA. The building blocks to make the RNA enter through an intake hole. They are matched to the DNA, letter by letter, to copy the A's, C's, T's, and G's of the gene. The only difference is that in the RNA copy, the letter T is replaced with a closely related building block known as U. You are watching this process called transcription in real time. It's happening right now in almost every cell in your body. Okay. So things to note is that the, uh, the DNA double helix is not destroyed. It's read, it's like a page of a book, but the page exists afterwards. And what's read is this yellow stuff, which is called messenger RNA, which is going to be used. And it's going on. And every cell in your body is like that. Jesus made that, as far as I can see, from reading the scripture. That's amazing. Isn't it? And there's a few mistakes in what we've read, what we've been shown so far already. They, they said that a gene was one stretch of DNA. Well, no, that's not true. If we get there, you'll find out why they think that now. What does this yellow stuff do? It snakes out into the outer part of the cell. Then, in a dazzling display of choreography, all the components of a molecular machine lock together around the RNA to form a miniature factory called a ribosome. It translates the genetic information in the RNA into a string of amino acids that will become a protein. Special transfer molecules, the green triangles, bring each amino acid to the ribosome. The amino acids are the small red tips attached to the transfer molecules. There are different transfer molecules for each of the 20 amino acids. Each transfer molecule carries a three-letter code that is matched with the RNA in the machine. Now we come to the heart of the process. Inside the ribosome, the RNA is pulled through like a tape. The code for each amino acid is read off, three letters at a time, and matched to three corresponding letters on the transfer molecules. When the right transfer molecule plugs in, the amino acid it carries is added to the growing protein chain. Again, you are watching this in real time. And after a few seconds, the assembled protein starts to emerge from the ribosome. Ribosomes can make any kind of protein. It just depends what genetic message you feed in on the RNA. In this case, the end product is hemoglobin. The cells in our bone marrow churn out a hundred trillion molecules of it per second. And as a result, our muscles, brain, and all the vital organs in our body receive the oxygen they need.
And the, the machine that's reading it is made up of proteins, which is coded for in the DNA. That's a puzzle we'll come to a bit later on. And when the protein comes out, it, it folds. And some of them fold into machines. And some fold and become enzymes, right? And they're all coded for in the DNA. Got the idea? It's astounding. Yeah? Some people would say incredible. No, it's believable because that's how it works. It's, it's, it's been shown to be so. So this is called the central dogma of molecular biology. It's in textbooks. It must be right, mustn't it? So there's DNA on the left. There's a molecular machine. The molecular machine actually runs along it. And it turns out this messenger RNA, but the DNA comes out unchanged. And then the mRNA goes to him. MRNA goes to another machine and it turns out protein. The mRNA after that gets recycled because it's highly efficient, it's green, you know. We don't have any wastage around here. Okay. Some illustrations of evolution. Well, Darwin found these finches on some of the Galapagos Islands when he went on his around the world trip, right? And the word evolution has a variety of meanings. It will be used by me to mean the descent of all life on Earth from a common ancestor, and by implication to have increased in complexity with time. It is important to note that the word evolution is also used to describe change, but with no increase in complexity. And often when there is, when there is a reduction in complexity, or even the loss of a feature, e.g. a fin of a stickleback fish, but the question is, where do the fins come from? Right. right. Darwin's finches are last. This is what he thought. This is 1845. He'd spotted these finches. By the way, they are all finches. Right? So this is an evolution into something completely different. Right? These are finches. Uh, but they have different sizes of beaks. So he says that seeing this gradation and diversity of structure in one small, intimately related group of birds, one might really fancy that from an original scarcity of birds in this set of islands, one species has been taken and uh, modified for different ends. Right? It's interesting how the beak changes, because it's not just the beak changing, the skull's changing in size at the same time. And why, why isn't one of the, the top beak getting bigger than the smaller one? What is controlling it? And they, they have no idea, right, at all. I've lost my cable again. Somebody, yeah. So can we do this out? There we go. That's okay. I might trip over now, but the cable won't fall out. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so that was one example. So evolution examples, right? That was the Galapagos Islands. Darwin assumed, because of what he believed, that it would take a long time to change, a very gradual change. However, this man called Peter Grant and his wife for 40 years went to these islands to make observations of what was currently happening. Right? And of course, nobody else would have gone because as everybody knows, nothing, was, nothing is going to change in 40 years because it takes us so long. So he wrote a book and uh, he was interviewed by Quantum Magazine and the lady interviewing him says, what are the biggest changes you've seen over the past 40 years in understanding of evolution? Peter Grant, from our studies and others, I think the general concept of the rate of evolution has changed. It's a much more rapid pro process than it was thought to be. When we started, most people would have been skeptical that you could get evolutionary change in one generation. It got change in one generation. It doesn't take billions of years necessarily. It can happen really fast. Right? Producing a bird with a more pointed beak, for example. Then he says the idea that the effects of nat natural selection are so minute that you can't measure them has been thrown out which is one of the things that people previously believed. And then this one's famous. So the pepper moth one was the one that they built teaching on because it's very visual, right? The argument goes like this. 
it's not entirely true, but this is how it's presented in textbooks and to young people. There are these peppered marsh. You, got, you get either a light one or a dark one. Well, obviously, the genes do that. Before the Industrial Revolution, uh, when the, the bark of trees was light, which is this bottom left picture here, uh, the light ones were camouflaged. Can you spot the light one? I can see a dark one. Where's the light one? You can't see it. Ooh. There it is, there. Well camouflaged. So the birds, we are told, that used to eat these, uh, found these rather dark ones easily seen, and therefore there were far more white ones than dark ones. Okay, it makes sense. Have I conned you yet? Because that's what they say. And then the Industrial Revolution came in the UK, for example, and soap came onto the lichen and killed them off, or colored trees dark, and now, well, there's the dark one there, you can see it. And there's the light one. And there were more dark ones than light ones. Do you like that? See, they always oversimplify their illustrations to prove their point. And illustrations do not prove anything. They only demonstrate what you already believe. You can get anything in between dark and light. I found that out very early on. That's outrageous that they present this. Birds don't fly about at night looking for moths. So what this convinces me is that they are so short of good illustrations or examples that they will take one and whatever. So I, my view is it's like that for all these things. Right, therefore, the conundrum. DNA is like a book full of instructions. It needs to be read and the instructions used. And you've seen that. But this is done by molecular machines that are made from instructions contained in the book. So you've got to make something, and the way you've got to make it is, well, you've got a book of instructions, but you've got to be able to read the book. But the only way you can read the book is getting something off the instructions which will tell you how to read. That is a book, right? In humans, the mother's egg cell already contains not just DNA, but already some of these machines. It's already there. Otherwise, we would never have got started. Right? Just DNA by itself, nothing will happen. It needs to be read. Now you can get, make more machines once you get going. And then notice this, cells always come from cells. No one has ever seen anything living which is not in a cell. You need a cell wall. Cells come from cells. That was spotted very early on. So in the light of that, uh, how do you get change which is inherited? Well, it's uh, mutations. So when, when the DNA is copied and a copy is made, uh, mistakes are made. You saw how fast it was reading, right? There, there are six billion letters. It was reading it fast. You try and read that fast and not whatever, or try and write that fast. So uh, there are machines that check for errors and correct them, but they don't correct them all. So the current view is that for every child you have, they have a hundred more mutations than you've got. And we've got a lot already. And my Newton grandchildren and great grandchildren are in the audience. So there are these errors. But if any of the, these errors could help make something more complex, that's how evolution would occur. So the conundrum is very clear, and the mutations are the way it works. Right? All examples that I know, which are used for teaching, assume that a single letter error in six billion produces a change in the subsequent life form, uh, which has an advantage, which gives it, well, gives it an advantage. But it's only one letter and one particular advantage. It, they in no way take into account that there can be multiple things going on at once. But that's for after, after we've eaten, if you still want to be here. <laughs> I hope I don't give you indigestion before. Yeah. I'm going to have to get out and go somewhere else. The, the problem is that we have no wires and it's taking a while to do certain things and it's not returning. I don't have... No, that's not good. Let's escape. Here we go. This might work. Oh, here we go. 
So Richard Dawkins is the most passionate advocate of evolution, right? He's written lots of books. Depending on your age, you will have come across them. Uh, there was one called The Selfish Gene. Your purpose in life is just to produce more DNA. That's all. And to protect it in your offspring. That's how it goes. It's all about DNA. And he's now talking about the origin of life. And some people are trying to explain it. And he's, sorry about the pun, he's killing it stone dead. Right? He really is. Thank you, my wife, whose name is Beryl Stone. Right? <coughs> <coughs> Right, an origin of life anywhere consists of the chance arising of a self-replicating entity. Nowadays, the replicator that matters on Earth is the DNA molecule. Now, you've been seeing about that, so that's how we work. But the original replicator probably was not DNA. He's conceded a bit, but he concedes more as he goes on. We don't know what it was. Unlike DNA, the original replicating molecules cannot have relied upon complicated machinery to duplicate them, the stuff you've been seeing. Although in some sense, they must have, must have. Now it's these must have statements that really get me going, because that is not science. You know, there's this thing, and it's come from that thing. And it must have. And it's, but they've got no evidence in between. They just use must have, and these are, these are science people that we are to bow down to. Don't you dare do that. The moment they use must have, they have no scientific proof, but there you go. There's a lot in the book I've been writing, by the way. They must have been equivalent to duplicate me instructions. The language in which the instructions were written was not a highly formalized language, like the one you've been seeing with the four letters and things. So that only a complicated machine could obey them. Can't have been like that. Too complicated. The original replicator cannot have needed elaborate decoding. As DNA instructions and computer viruses do today. That's how it works. Self-duplication was an inherent property of this initial thing, of the, ent of the entity structure, just to say hardness is an inherent property of a diamond. This man is stretching. Something that does not have to be decoded and obeyed. It has to be. It must have been. Because he believes that life arose naturally. But it is a belief. And he can't say, therefore, you were wrong because I'm science. He can't do that. This is classic. Right? This is a, his book called, called Climbing Mount Improbable. Right? Unlike their later successors, the DNA molecules, they did not have complicated decoding and instruction obeying machinery because complicated machinery is the kind of thing that arises in the world only after many generations of evolution. But it never got started, so it couldn't have evolved. I think I'm being recorded. Yeah. I once debated Richard Dawkins at the University of Bristol a long time ago. Right. So the origin of life, you've seen that, right? This is the central dogma, right? But it's not that simple, right? So uh, hopefully you keep going with me now, right? But I thought you the details are covered. We've already done that, right? It's a bit more complicated than that. So how about this one? So the, the previous diagram had the left-hand one, and I've given you a name there, and there's the right-hand one. But there's this. Because when they said that molecule went off and there was a gene and it read it, that is not true. That is just not true. It's simplified so that simple kids at school can be taught about it. I understand that. But it makes it more simple than it is. So it's easy to accept. All right? There's another thing that has to go on that's called a, a spliceosome, which actually joins bits up. All right? And these three together... Well, plus others will come across in a moment, they make protein. And those are the proteins that make these machines in the first place. Right. Ooh. So I'm interested in this spliceosome now. Here, here we go. So the RNA has been... As formed. DNA is transcribed into RNA, it needs to be edited to remove non-proteins or introns shown in the green. This editing process is called splicing, which involves removing the introns, leaving only the yellow proteins.
decoding regions called exons. RNA splicing begins with assembly of helper proteins at the intron-exon borders. These splicing factors act as beacons to guide small nuclear viral proteins to form a splicing tissue called the spliceosome. The animation is showing is happening in real time. The spliceosome then brings the exons on either side of the intron very close together, ready to be cut. One end of the intron is cut and folded back on itself to join and form a loop. The spliceosome then cuts the RNA to release the loop and join the two exons together. The edited RNA and intron are released and the spliceosome disassembles. This process is repeated for every intron in the RNA. Numerous spliceosomes, shown here in purple, assemble along the RNA. Each spliceosome brings one intron, releasing the loop before disassembly. In this example, three introns are removed from the RNA to leave the complete instruction for a protein. So of these six billion letters, less than 3% code for proteins, which is what it's all about. The rest, is, historically, has been called junk for various reasons. It had no function, they thought, how long can you be, right? But the, the bits of code for proteins are not all together. They're all over in different places. So somehow, there are these machines that know where to go, and they read it, but then there's these other machines that know they've got to come along and cut out the bit. So the bits that are going to be used for proteins are called exons, and the ones that to be removed are called introns, because they're in the way. Got to cut them. All right? So it is wrong to say. That was completely misleading. How, you let me get away with it. I told you a lie when I put that up. A, a gene is not just a single stretch. It's bits from all over the place. OK? Yes. Now, here we go. All these machines need energy. You know, you've got to connect them to the mains. Where, where, where does the energy come from? They don't tell you about that, no, normally anyway. There's this uh, molecular machine that provides energy for all the machines. It actually works in a very interesting way, which is that it basically uses lots of uh, very small batteries. Uh, and a battery gets charged up, and I'll show you how in a moment, and then it goes to where it's needed, and it gives up its charge, and it's gone flat, and then it goes all the way back to the charging up machine, and it gets charged up again. And this is going on all the time in every cell of your body right now. You'd be amazed what's going on inside. Hope you don't get nervous about it. God is on the throne, and he looks after us, you know. Right? So this charging thing, how, how does it work? The picture's a bit small, but there's, uh, there's this thing called ATP. Forget what that stands for for now. This machine rotates, and this molecule called ATP is the one that cycles around, and this is where it gives up its energy. So when it's flat coming in here, there are only two of these little things here. And as it comes in here, this machine, which is rotating at 10,000 RPM inside yourself right now, Right? It forces in an extra one of these. So it's a bit like a coil spring with a clip on it. So it pushes in and it locks. And it locks. And then when it gets to the place where it's needed, it gets unlocked and the energy gets given to it. It's clever. Right? So, I like this bit. On any given day, you turn over your body weight equivalent in ATP. It's going all the time because you need energy. I mean, we're not going to think about how, it, how the energy gets to this thing because, well, this is sort of introductory, but a little bit more than that at the moment. You get the idea. It's, it's a battery charger. We need them in Australia for electric vehicles. Right? But no, this one's very much more clever than that. Right. <clears throat> These processes that are going on will operate very, very slowly unless they had... Well, it's a bit like you made a, uh, an engine and you forgot about lubrication. 
So you've got no, you forgot to put oil in your engine. It would seize up. So you need things to lubricate to keep going. Well, these machines need certain things to make sure that they operate fast enough. And that they use these things called catalytic enzymes. And they're a bit of a mystery in chemistry too. And I'm not a chemist. Uh, basically, an enzyme helps something, a chemical process, go faster, but never gets consumed. That's clever, right? That's what it does. So here they go. And there are these enzymes in our body. And they make these uh, catalytic, catalytic enzymes, which allow the machines to operate at the speed you saw. But if they weren't around, uh, you'd be dead, right? So this is one of them here, right? There's a chemical reaction that changes, never mind what it is, to that. But that is an essential precursor of RNA and DNA. Outside a cell, the time to change half of this thing would take 78 million years. Don't live that long, right? For so-called half time. However, in a cell, this is reduced to 18 milliseconds by the catalyst and the catalyst is made right, from information stowed, stored on the coke. Are you left-handed or right-handed? I was left-handed. I was made to change at school because in my day they hit you. Oh, if you didn't change. So when you, if you make some of the building blocks of, of life in a sort of pea soup thing, I might think about that later on, I don't know. Um, if you do it with an electric discharge, you get equal numbers of what are called left-handed and right-handed. So these two molecules are basically the same thing. You call them the same thing, but one is a mirror shape, mirror reflection of the other. Right? So if it happens naturally, you'd expect in our bodies and in living things to have 50-50. No, you don't. You get 100% of one. It's absolutely pure. So how did a random process which supposedly starts life end up with us having you know, exactly the right handed things in us? Right? Living organisms generally just use pure forms, i.e. only including one of the two left hand. Such 100% pure forms are said to be, never mind the word. In contrast to living organisms, laboratory experiments that produce these amino acids and sugar is always produced an approximately 50-50 mixture. Right, the horrors of the thalidomide drug disaster resulted from this problem of left-handed and right-handed. One of the things was the wrong hand, and that was a disaster. So it's important that they're all the same. But how, how do they get to be all the same? Well, the machines in our body make sure they are. They add these amino acids one at a time, chemically pure. To do that actually physically outside of cells, very difficult altogether. And then this is the experiment that proved, I remember Reader's Digest a long time ago, right? Life created in a test tube, if you come across that. And it was this experiment, this is 1953. In fact, they did the experiment before you know, the DNA double helix was discovered. But they thought if you could get something like the early atmosphere of the Earth and zap it with electricity and so on, you might get some of the building blocks. So we're talking, for younger people, it's a bit like, how do you make the Lego bricks before you assemble them? So how do you make them? Well, you just put all the necessary chemicals in this thing and you, and out come Lego bricks. That's how it works. Well, they produced about four of the amino acids in this particular apparatus, uh, but they were equally left-handed and right-handed. And so you've got Lego bricks. They're useless unless you can put them together. So how did they get put together? But they were so keen to find any explanation of how life started that this became, this is still presented in modern textbooks as the best evidence they've got for how life started. Right? Hello. <laughs> so there is no scientific explanation. There's no experimental evidence for any possible path to life. So there's a creator, and people are without excuse. And there are these prizes I mentioned. There was one the year, starting in the year 2000, which was for a million 
American dollars, but that was withdrawn in 2013, and their associated website closed. And then more recently, another prize has been offered. This was 2019, and it's at 10 million US. And uh, this is by this man, Dennis Noble, who will pop up a bit after we've eaten. He's a professor at Oxford University, and he's a fellow of the Royal Society, and he's an evolutionist. He says, with respect to this prize, how did life get going in the first place and what is the origin of the genetic code? I would regard those as the two very, very big questions for science today. There are no answers. Now, my atheist friends who read the book, one of them said, I've now come to believe, as you do, that there are two faiths. There's an atheistic faith and there's a Christian faith. And he said, I'm happy for you to have your faith, but as for me, I believe that in the end, science will have all the answers. So he's put his absolute final hope on science finding answers to these things. Now again, this probably won't, be, won't work. Nope. And I've got five minutes, because I, I said I would use the time of an hour to do this one. In case you don't come to the second session, because you have got indigestion, um, there's this bit here about competing, are they competing faiths? Now this is a rather standard quote, and it's used a lot, but it's very important, right? This is, uh, in 1997, this is an atheistic materialist, believes there is no God, right? You can explain everything by natural causes. But this is what he wrote, Right, I'll read it slowly, well, maybe with emphasis at times. Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of a scientific community for unsubstantiating just so stories. And by that he's referring to Kipling's explanation of how the elephant got its trunk because a crocodile got hold of its nose and pulled it out. Because it's just a story. Any explanation will do. So that's a just so story. And why does he do that? With all this stacked against him, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the um, natural world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori, which means our initial assumption, not by that, here, adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations. They won't ever come up with a supernatural one. You will not get a scientific paper published in a, in a proper journal if you anyway refer to supernatural. It's got to be natural. No matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated, now listen to this. If this isn't a statement of faith, I don't know what is. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Right? And our institutions, you have to accept this stuff, because the supernatural is not allowed in anything of a biological or whatever kind. If you're an engineer, you can get away with being a Christian much more easily, particularly when you see these machines and wonder how they ever came to be. You can't see it. Why didn't you tell me? Thank you, guys. Oh, it's good to have a sympathetic audience. Dear me. You can read it fast now, can't you? No, time is going. I've got, I've got about three minutes. All right? You can have a look at it sometime. So this is man Harrison Matthews. And he wrote the, the, the preface to the 1972 edition of Darwin's Origin of Species. Well thought of. He is an evolutionist, but he admits to faith being involved. I love this man. 
even though I disagree with him. He says, during the last 50 years, genetics has unraveled many of the extremely complex phenomena of inheritance and has shown that evolution by natural selection of random mutations, generally of small size, is a logical explanation of the origin of the immense array of organisms now in, in the past living on Earth. The theory is so plausible, I thought it was proven. The theory is so plausible that most biologists accept it as though it were a proven fact, although their conviction rests upon circumstantial evidence, it forms a satisfactory faith on which to base our interpretation of nature. It's a faith position. You know, science hasn't proved us wrong. They have a different belief. The man who was not my best man, who is not a Christian, looked at this book and came out and said, uh, Dawkins has this materialistic faith which is clothed in a cloak of science, supposedly. Then this same man a little later wrote, the evolution of new species of animals before our eyes through changes in the genetic code is not apparent. You can't see it happening. It is believed to take place by natural selection, acting upon cumulative small changes over a long period of time. In where? I'll clearly observe, no, in populations isolated by geographical or other barriers, which is why there's no fossilism. It's called niche stuff. Somewhere over there, uh, there's this little population, and it happened there. But we have no evidence of it, and all of a sudden there's this new thing. Well, that's how it works. No, it's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an explanation without any detail, proof at all. Well. I'll end with this in the second session, but I need to do it now in case you don't come back. And I will know you didn't come back because I recognize you. Right. So it really is an important issue altogether. Right. If there is no God and what they say is true, despite their belief statements, then life is absolutely meaningless. It really is. There's no basis for morals or whatever. So. This is Richard Dawkins. In a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is a bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. DNA neither cares nor knows. DNA just is. And we dance to his music. To its music. Oh. No wonder some people take their lives. They're taught this stuff at school. Um, and at university. Boy. Some of the lectures will start off with anybody who believes in God, first year. Yeah. And they put your hand up and they say, you won't by the time I finish this unit. And the objective is to destroy your faith. What's the basis for it? And then this guy, William Provey. Let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear. And these are basically Darwin's views. There are no gods, no purposes and no goal-directed forces of any kind. There is no life after death. When I die, I am absolutely certain that I'm going to be dead. That's the end of me. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning in life, and no free will for humans. Talk to me about that, why he thinks that. No free will for humans either. What an unintelligible idea. There you go. And what do we say? Well, we're these gullible people of faith who believe what the Bible says for all sorts of reasons. And we say these things. The world is like it is because there was a fall. God made it good. Right? And because of the fall, right? It's like this. This is in Romans. For the creation was subjected to frustration not only by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. 
but the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. We'll look at decay in the next session. And brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our body, the Christian hope. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And then this is uh, what Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us, we've been born again, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. There you go. You've been saved by grace and you're trusting Christ. <laughs> There's no way you go the other way. And it is our responsibility to make uh, the gospel now, to tell people about Jesus and the resurrection, which is the New Testament says is a proof. And to be aware, to answer some folks. So, so far, if you're going to go, right, the origin of life, no one knows or people would have won prizes, right? And then there's this circular argument, and Dawkins admits it. All living forms that we know have DNA, but there are machines, but they are coded for in the DNA. How, how could that happen? You need both things at once. And it's even more complicated than that, which you will see after you've had some food. But thank you for your attention. Did I make you scared at all? Because that, is that why the gap is here? Good. Shall we say, no, I don't care. Amen. Thank you very much, Brian. Now, if you feel overwhelmed because that was too technical, don't worry about it. We want you to hang around. The food's hot. I'm going to give thanks. But one thing we've been reminded of there's two ways to live, mm. isn't there? Yep. There's two ways to live, and there's two ways to think, isn't there? Two ways to think. Who are we going to believe? We're going to believe what God says. Let me pray, and then we're going to enjoy the hot food. Our Father, blessed be your name. We thank you that you are ours and we are yours forever. We thank you that you sent your precious Son, the Lord Jesus, into this world to save sinners. And we can easily look at ourselves and say, wow, we are surely the chief of all sinners. Thank you for our fellowship. Thank you for what we've heard so far and what we're going to hear after tea. Father, we want to give you thanks and praise for the position that you've brought us into, that we are in Christ. And Father, as we enjoy this hot food, uh, we give you thanks and praise.